The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. It's been a tough last 12 months for everyone. So as people across Ontario observe a quieter family day this year, we've got a conversation to soothe frayed nerves. Psychotherapist and author Julia Samuel is with us tonight on her new book, and how's this for a timely title? This too shall pass. Then we revisit our recent discussion with community leaders from rural Ontario about how people in their regions are coping through this COVID-19 era. It's Family Day, Monday, February 15th, and that's next on The Agenda. Sooner or later, everyone faces obstacles, failure, and even profound grief because, well, life simply entails such hardships. But as she did in her last book, Grief Works, Author and psychotherapist Julia Samuel brings together indispensable wisdom and advice about how to carry on. It's all in her new book, This Too Shall Pass, stories of change, crisis, and hopeful beginnings. And it brings back to our airwaves from Somerset, UK, Julia Samuel. It's so good to see you again. We were just saying before we started how disappointed we are that we can't do this in person, but I'm glad this is the next best thing. So it's great to welcome you back to our airwaves. How are you? I'm really well and lovely to see you and to be with your audience. I loved my last trip to Canada and so I feel sad and lucky. It's the bittersweet. Everything is bittersweet these days, right? So true. When you can make stuff work, you're happy, but you're also pissed off that it's not like it was. <laughs> is that a, a psychotherapeutic <laughs> term that you just used there? Yeah. Got yeah, it. Definitely. Got it. Well, let's start with a quote from the book, shall we? Sheldon, if you would, the graphic. Life is change. We know this in theory, but the experience of it is often more complex than we expect, and we are left fearful, even paralyzed. Then we assume we must be doing it wrong. First question, if we know this is the case, why is change so difficult for so many of us? I think, I mean, everybody that's come through my door, they know that life is change and they kind of welcome the change, but they don't want to do the change themselves that goes with it. Do you know what I mean? That So the first arrow is the bad news. So you've broken up with your partner or you've lost your job or you've got a health diagnosis or you recognize you're in a pandemic. But we, we are born adaptive, but we fear the not knowing of, of the new versions of ourselves. So we kind of hold on to, like grim death, the older versions, because we prefer the familiar to the scary unknown. I mean, I think one of the biggest things people are finding hard now is, is not having control and not knowing what on earth is going to happen next or not being able to make plans. Well, you've no doubt had a huge litany, a very long list of different ailments come through your doors over the years. I know you've mentioned a few of them here, but if you had to rank them, what are the most serious changes that people are the most afraid of having to undergo? I think it, there are two, I think, in particular. I think the three big ones are your relationship, losing your job, and a health diagnosis. Um, obviously, your life being threatened is radically the most frightening because it may mean the end of your life. And you're, that you know, all of us live like every day. We wake up assuming that tomorrow is going to be the same as today. And a, a, a diagnosis that you have a life-threatening illness, grief starts at the point of diagnosis because you don't, you kind of plan your death. I think you immediately sort of imagine you're going to die. And so that, that is very scary, I think. Hmm. Does that kind of trepidation happen even when the news is good and not just bad? You've read my book. I'm very impressed. <laughs> um, so, yes, I, because, you know, when you commit to a relationship, you've had this dream ever since you were eight years old that you're going to commit to somebody and you're going to have this happy future. And then when you actually do it, you realize that in order to live with them and commit to them, you have to give up a whole lot of stuff. You have to give up having, well, if you, it depends on your relationship, but most people have to give up having sex with other people or you have to do their laundry or deal with their bad mood. So nothing comes for nothing. And we, you know, the first arrow is the change. And the second arrow is what we do about the change and how we kind of 
shift ourselves, to reshape ourselves. And those that change, that are most adaptable, are the happiest in life. Those that resist change, um, that get hit by change again when it happens, and it does happen every seven or eight years, are the least happy, are the least content. Hmm. And do you know why some people are better at it than others? I think it's partly their, their upbringing. It might be partly their DNA. I think it's a lot to do with what's been modelled to you about previous losses. You know, like now we're all, what I call the change now is a living loss. So all the things that we predicted that we can have, like seeing our friends, making plans, having holidays, they've been taken off the table. And, and the experience of that is a loss. It's a living loss and it's experienced like grief. And if you've observed your parents managing those losses and what they do with them, we learn from our parents. And so if you've seen parents that are pretty adaptable and, and robust, then you tend to be as well. And if you don't have parents? If you don't have parents, then you're more likely to be vulnerable. You're less, less likely to have secure attachment. And you're more likely to want to have to control and kind of grip very tightly onto what you do have and fear letting go everything and anything. And I presume... I mean, you can't is, always say... Yeah, that's not a recipe for success, I presume. No. I mean, there are always people who go against the stats. But if you're going to look at young people's outcomes, secure parents, loving parents who are reliable and consistent and present in your life, you get the best outcomes for those, the lifelong outcome for those children and young people as they develop in, into adults. Let's pull another quote from the book here, since we're on the issue of young people. We all have a natural coping mechanism when change hits us, which we learn in childhood. It's a habitual response. Perhaps we switch off, become overwhelmed, or if we're among the fortunate few, immediately absorb and deal with change. We need to understand what our response is so that we can learn to be more flexible. Now, you've pointed out the, the role that parents have in dealing with all of this, but what other influences would be there in childhood that would have that kind of impact as well? I think culture has an enormous impact. I think one of the things that's difficult now is that we expect with, with technology in the digital age, we expect to have so much more control than we actually have. And we expect our psychology and our being to be the equivalent of a fast track app, fast track app that we can just shift ourselves. And human beings, we take time to change. It takes much longer than we want. Um, and we need to support ourselves and allow it and not resist it. And do parents actually sort of consciously teach their children how to be resilient? Or is this just behavior that they model and kids pick it up? It's through modeling. I think we learn far more than from what parents do than what they say. My mum always said the reverse. My mum always said, don't do what I do, do as I say. <laughs> <laughs> And so I never, ever did either because it wasn't a re very reliable source. Uh, I'll let you in on a little secret. I, I think probably every parent in the world has said that at one time or another, right? <laughs> yes. I think so. Now, if you didn't learn it in childhood, what are your chances of picking it up later in life? I think, I think you learn it from your colleagues at work. Maybe you learn it from a partner. Maybe you're wired to adapt, but I mean, it, the chances are less. I mean, Steve, how have you, how do you manage change? Are you, do you adapt easily? Do you resist? Do you, what do you, men tend to resist it. Well, I, the first question I have here is how did I lose control of this interview where you're now asking me questions <laughs> rather than vice versa? But okay, since you've I gone the there. I am therapist. Yes, you yeah. are. And uh, I'm not lying on the couch here, but it's the next best thing. Uh, okay, well, apropos of what you just said, I would say I was incredibly lucky to grow up in a middle-class household with two loving parents who, thank God, are still happily married, and that wow. was modeled to me, and, um, and there you go. Uh, unconditional love, I'm sure, had a huge part to do with it, so there we go. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that is, that's the best way to start, isn't it? That's it's an amazing is. beginning. You win the lottery on day one, and it, it's all great after that. Well, not all of it, but, yeah. you know, you, you no. do pretty good. Yeah. Um, let's, let's follow up with this. You write that the past is no longer a reliable predictor of the future, which leads to instability in people's lives. Was it ever really a reliable predictor of the future? Probably not, but I think there's been more societal change in the last 50 years than in the previous 
200 years. You know, women going to work, mm -hmm. the institutions of marriage and church not really giving us the rules of life anymore. There's much more fluidity of gender, sexuality, how we behave. We're going to live much longer. So the kind of three-stage life of education, working and retirement is no longer there. There's so much that is kind of fluid and it gives people choices, which is, I think, exciting and can be very um, fulfilling. But I think a lot of young people feel very overwhelmed by the numbers, number of choices or thinking they should have choices when they don't. Hmm. All right, let's focus now on the changes that happen to people at work. And once again, Sheldon, if you wouldn't mind, I'll ask our director to bring up the next quote from the book. Careers, you write, for generations X and Y are more turbulent than for their parents. Politically, much is made of the power of the individual, freedom of choice, and breadth of possibility. What is ignored is our inborn need to belong to a tribe, to be part of an organization where the individual is protected by the group, its purpose, and territory. This is both frightening and at times untenable and can lead them to give up even before they start. Let's dive into that a bit. Why are careers so much more turbulent these days than, say, 50 years ago? Because the contracts are different. You know, in the past, big companies like Shell or ICI or big media companies, they would invest in someone and follow them through the pathway to work with them for like 30 years. And now we're in the, the gig economy where you the most somebody works with, for somebody else, maybe three years, but you know, tons of jobs don't have contracts and they're not long term. I think a lot of that's to do with the digital age um, and how life is changing. And I think it is scary. I mean, have you seen that in your lifetime, this thing of, you know, I worked in the NHS and I for 25 years and I still work for them voluntarily now. But I love that thing of being part of the building, like walking into the place where I know everybody, where they know me, where we have history together. And, it, you know, wearing my lanyard with the badge gives me a sense of belonging that nothing else does. That I'm part of a system and an organisation that I'm really proud of. And it's a big part of my identity. And I think even people working in the NHS now don't think they'll necessarily be there for their whole life, although it's more likely in medicine than other careers. But the reality is anybody over the age of 20 today, particularly if they're in a post-secondary institution, they know that that is not, it's, it's much less likely today that that is going to be their future. They always say in journalism class, don't try and get a job at a legacy media outlet, figure out how to create your own job. Uh, if and that comes with pressure, doesn't it? Yeah. It's like it's all down to you. Being part of a bigger system, mm -hmm. it's like you're grandparented and mentored and looked mm -hmm. after, whereas now it's like, you know, people want independence, but actually I think we're wired to be interdependent. We need each other. We need multiple generations being in the room at the same time. We need history. Indeed, but having said that, do the people of those generations not have to accept the fact that the world's not going back to the way it is, or the way it was. This is the way it is, and you just have to adapt. I think that's true. I don't think there is any choice. Mm -hmm. I, but, you know, I, with the, the stats right now, 25% of young women from 14 to 25 were anxious that, in the UK. That's increased to 35%. And for young men, it was 20%, and it's gone to 30%. And I don't know whether that's because people are more open and honest about their mental health and their kind of owning up to their anxiety. But if it's from the stats from before, they're far more an anxious than, say, my generation or your generation. Hmm. I think we're the same generation, ma'am. Are, are we OK? <laughs> I thought you were younger than me. Uh, afraid not. <laughs> uh, OK, let's check at the other end of the continuum, and that is many boomers who are near nearing retirement and fear what that represents in their lives. Uh, for many of them, you know, retirement's not such a good thing. They're very wrapped up in their identity, which is their job, and there is a great uncertainty with what comes next. Uh, how do you ease the fears of that transition? I think a lot of them are doing it by working part-time, doing sort of bridge employment or mentoring or volunteering. But a lot of people don't have choice and they're continuing to work. But there is this push from below, like, get out of the way. We need the space that you're sitting in. Um, 
but also they're going to live much longer. And so there's the other aspect of retirement is that there's a health span and a wealth span as a as well as a kind of work span. Is that, you know, once you're 65, your health is I can't remember the stats now. They're in my book somewhere. People have like maybe four or five conditions by the time they're 70. Um, so the capacity to work and the meaning and connection to others, they have much higher um, mental health problems. You know, I just checked on my iPhone here. You've actually got yeah. nine months on me, Dr. Samuel. I'm have surprised. I? <laughs> I thought I had nine months on you, but you've actually got nine months on me. Anyway, let, me, let me follow up with, with okay. um, uh, do you advise people not to uh, get wrapped up? Um, I'm not saying this well. Should people avoid um, trying to wrap up their own sense of self in their jobs? I guess that's it. I mean, I think we have multiple identities. And I mean, my work identity has been incredibly important to me. And actually, work has saved me when other things in life have been very, very difficult. So I think it's, you know, Freud said you need work and love. And I think we need both. But I think if it's your only identity where you get your self-worth, your self-esteem and purpose and meaning, then there's a, a big old hole to fill when you retire. I mean, the thing that everybody says that if you can, don't stop working. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't plan to stop working anytime soon. I plan to go on working until I kind of keel over <laughs> because I love what I do and you know, I will want to continue. I think I would just die of boredom and I, uh, if if I didn't work. So, I mean, I'm the very person that you're saying, is my identity too wrapped up with my work? And maybe the answer is yes. Uh, I'm with you, but I've always assumed that this was a temporary job. And therefore, I've, you know, I, I have been preparing myself for the day I will not have this job from the day I got it. Do you think that way as 100%. well? Well, that's, that's 20, like, I don't know, 28, 29 years ago. That's a lot. And even if you're preparing, you're, it'll still be a shock, right? I yes, know. I have been preparing. <laughs> I've definitely thought if I if I can't practice anymore, if they suddenly put down a kind of UKCP, you can't practice over 65, I would volunteer. I'd, I'd work in the community. I would definitely do stuff, hmm. um, even if I'm not paid for it. This is obviously a pretty stressful time for a lot of people because of this pandemic. And uh, I guess... Many folks are trying to find some kind of positive takeaway from their loss of freedom, their loss of being able to see family, et cetera, et cetera. What would you suggest they take away in terms of a positive from all of this? I, you know, people talk about, you know, post-traumatic growth, and that never takes away from the um, terribleness or the, the kind of pain of, of the trauma, whatever it is. And I think people are really suffering right now. But the post-traumatic growth is what is revealed after the experience. And I hope people will really use this and afterwards, because maybe you can't do it while you're actually in it because it's too anxiety provoking, to reflect on what really matters to them in life. You know, from the work in my book, the thing, the single thing that matters to us most is love and connection. That love is strong medicine. And we don't prioritize our relationships. I would imagine that the majority of people who've had to do social distance, which I think are the two chilliest words in our lexicon right now, will be thinking, was I too busy? Did I travel too much? Do I need to go into the office as much as I did? Did I prioritize my friendships and my family relationships and my home life? Do I want to change how I live to make space for them? Because... I think we really have, I mean, everybody has missed that connection so much. It's been visceral, hasn't it? It's been terrible. Well, it does lead to the next quote I want to pluck from the book here, and it is about loneliness, which you say, loneliness and isolation are killers in old age. The majority of the 7.7 .7 million people in 2016 who lived alone were women. It is therefore women who are at the highest risk of getting long-term chronic illnesses like diabetes and heart failure as a consequence of that social isolation. I guess I should just clarify, the 7.7 .7 million people I assume is in the UK? It's in the UK, it's actually 9 million now. And it's 9 million now. Hmm. Um, and that's the, it's the, the health risk is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. My goodness. 
That loneliness is magnified, right, tenfold, a thousandfold right now because of the pandemic. How do you recommend people deal with it at this time? I think there are multiple things. I, I, I do think that you need to, to actually ask for people to contact you. I think some people just wait to be contacted and then they build up a resentment against the people who haven't called them or haven't Skyped them or Zoomed them. So I think you have to recognize that we do, we psychologically for our survival really need connection to other people and we need to have it scheduled in our diaries. So on a Sunday afternoon or a Saturday afternoon, you know you've got a call with someone. And, and, and that, you know, it's not as good a quality as seeing them, but it's, be, it's a great deal better than none. Because Is, you go into it, go on. I was just going to ask, do you think there will be long-term consequences to young people who have not been able to interact with fellow children or teenagers, you know, for what could be a year or more by the end of this thing? Yeah, I mean, I think the underbelly pandemic, the mental health pandemic, I don't think we really know what the consequences are. What we do know is that there's much increased anxiety for men and young men and young women. We also know that an earlier intervention supports their better outcomes. And there's nothing like any intervention that's happening now that is meeting the demand or the complexity and the difficulty. So, you know, I hope that they will find that they're more resilient and robust than we think they are. Um, but I do, I really worry. And we need to make it a priority. Otherwise, it's, you know, the consequences are dire. Hmm. And it's terrible for their parents. Yes. In, in our remaining moments here, I do want to, um, well, uh, let's see if we can leave things on a more constructive note here as we look forward, <laughs> yes. because uh, many yeah. of the stories in your book deal with changes to people and, and you know, they're significant going from single to married or going from uh, just a couple to suddenly becoming parents or dealing with, uh, as you've pointed out, a, a difficult health situation. You go from healthy to not. How do you begin to accept a change in one's own identity? I think, first of all, to know that you aren't in charge of it, that you need to kind of find a way of accommodating it, that you can't fight it, you can't will your way to have it a particular way. You need to kind of listen. You have to know yourself and not distract yourself. You have to support yourself in very intentional ways and get support and allow the natural process of adaptation and evolving to occur. And for that, you also need time. You know, there's something in the book I call the fertile void, which is the time between an end and a new beginning. And so you need that fertile void of not knowing of a kind of limbo where you allow the kind of natural organic process of change to emerge. And then, then you're congruent, then your authentic self, rather than some kind of tidy manufactured self that you want to kind of fit into an image of what Instagram tells you you should be. <laughs> what does Instagram tell us we should be? Well, I, I, I mean, I'm, it's simplistic because actually Instagram, I think, has been a big connector in, in um, COVID. But, you know, perfect. Perfect body, lips, boobs, hair, you know, and that you every, every, that you say you're so happy and you're living your best life and, you know. It's a bit gross after a true. while, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, and it just can't be true. Yeah. I don't want to give away. Um, I, I feel like this is a, a you know a murder mystery, and I don't want to give away the ending. But but you do have in the back of the book here what you call eight pillars of strength for times of change. And um, again, if you want to leave some of that mysterious, that's fine. But but maybe you could help us understand why you landed on these eight things and why they're so crucial to getting through this time. I mean, I will tell you, the thing to uh, say before that is that hope is the alchemy that turns a life around, mm -hmm. that we have to have hope. And hope isn't just a feeling. It is a belief system that you can, we can't predict what we can hope for, when it's going to be, but we can plan. So my hope is that I'm going to have a sit-down sit dinner with six friends. So that's an achievable, and the idea of us just sitting there, hugging each other, chatting, you know, being round a, a table in a restaurant is what my kind of 
out of pandemic dream is. And I can really think about that. And it make, I can feel it in my body. It makes me happy thinking about that. And it's a very realistic hope that I believe is going to happen. And that supports me. And the pillars of strength are the pillars that help you have that hope. So it's your relationship with yourself, your relationship with others. It's taking exercise is really crucial, your connection between mind and body. So it's the beliefs, the attitudes, and the ways of being that hold you steady when everything beneath you is is rocking you. Is and it, they, they really help stability. Is it not equally possible, though, that as you visualize that, it'll just make you more miserable because you know that's still months away? Well, I mean, you can look at it like that. <laughs> but I choose, I choose not to. You're a glass half full person. Yeah, I am actually. But also, it's a, it's a very achievable. So I don't I don't even put it in time. I put it as an image, of of having a laugh. I, the thing I really miss is laughing and having fun. So I watch funny telly because that's you know you can't be angry and sad and laugh at the same time. So that's what I do in the evenings. So I watch funny telly. That's a I great never expression. Watch the news. That is it. Oh, no. OK, I got to follow up on those. First of all, great expression. Funny telly. That is something no Canadian would say. So I'm happy to learn that new expression. And, okay. and that next thing is interesting. You never watch the news, you say? No, because it, the news is contagion. It makes me feel negative and fearful. I mean, I read it for about five minutes so I know what's going on, but I never watch it because it makes me not sleep at night. I get I get wake up with a pounding heart at four in the morning. Well, can I urge everybody uh, to disregard that piece of advice as it relates to this interview? Because we certainly want them to watch this exquisite piece of current affairs television right now, don't we, Julia? Yes, we do. Yes, we I'm do. I'm only talking about myself, but yeah. <laughs> well, I, I can't think of a more appropriate title for a book than the one that you have on this one here. Yeah. This Too Shall Pass. Stories of change, crisis, and hopeful beginnings. And we are so delighted that it has brought Julia Samuel, if not to our studio, at least to our airwaves all the way from the UK. So good to see you again. So lovely. And thank you, Steve, for, uh, for everything. It was, I feel cheered today. It's been such a lovely conversation. Thank you so much. We've all heard a lot about how COVID-19 prompted lockdowns and disruption in hotspots in the province, especially in the greater Toronto area. But the pandemic most certainly has not passed smaller and rural communities by, as the current state of emergency makes clear. With us to get a sense of just what this crisis has felt like in their areas, can we welcome, from furthest away to closest to our studio, as is our custom, on Manitoulin Island, not far from Little Current, there's Al McNevin. He's the mayor of the town of northeastern Manitoulin and the islands. In Greater Napanee, just west of Kingston, Ontario, Mayor Marg Isbester. In Trent Hills, Ontario, just northeast of Belleville, Municipal Councillor Catherine Redden. She's a former three-term mayor of Campbellford and recently retired from the board of the Rural Ontario Institute. And in Collingwood, Ontario, Dr. Jennifer Young. She's a family physician who attends patients in hospital and community practice and is a past president of the Ontario College of Family Physicians. Great to welcome you four from various parts of our province. And, and I actually don't want to assume that everybody watching this knows where you four are from. So I'm going to start by just having our director, Sheldon Osmond, bring up this map to show that we've really got, I guess, from the French River down, pretty well covered here. Little Current, Manitoulin Island, largest freshwater island in the world, just about two hours southwest of Sudbury. And then coming down at the foot of Georgian Bay, there's Collingwood. And then as we go into the eastern part of the province, Trent Hill and Greater Napanee as we move towards Kingston and eventually Ottawa. So that's where you four are. And Mark, why don't you get us started with this? Rural means different things to different people. What does it mean to you? Uh, it not only does it mean different things to different people, Steve, but it also is evolving. So right now, I, I see rural in our area as uh, meaning there's there's a great sort of community feel. Uh, nice thing about going through this pandemic is there is support from groups from faith faith based and so on. But that's changing a lot in that people are evolving and moving out to our areas. So therefore, rural is also looking for all the amenities 
that uh, even the more populated areas have, but it's still got a good feel and just as much fear in our area as there are in the urbans. Hmm. Catherine Redden, how about you? What does rural mean to you? Well, I think, as Marga said, the definition of rural is, is becoming more blurred. It used to be any ur area not urban, but um, we have some great developments now that are, are growing in, in leaps and bounds. But it's still that, that area that's uh, a little less settled, a little less populated, um, still has good services. And it has that great community spirit where you literally know everyone if you're not related to them. You know them or you've seen them on the streets. And um, it's an area that is becoming uh, um, more of, uh, of somewhere that everyone else wants to be just because of the lifestyle. Jennifer Young. Uh, uh, in healthcare, there is a this the definition of rurality that is called the, the Ontario Rurality Index. And what it does is combine a combination of population density and distance from your primary health care, as well as distance from health care that would be more secondary, so, so more advanced uh, referral services. And to me, it also in, in Bavadis, because of that uh, relative lack of density, there's also a less density of, of healthcare professionals. And, and each healthcare professional in the rural area tends to need to be a generalist. So family doctors in particular play so many different roles because of that less, uh, less density of specialists. They are in the eMERGE, in the hospital, doing OB, long-term care, leadership. And many other of our colleagues nurses and um, play those more generalist roles the more rural you get. Understood. Al McNevin. Well, I'd have to agree with a lot of the comments from the other uh, participants, but uh, uh, it's for us, it's a, a caring uh, community that uh, has a smattering of agriculture and settlements, villages, uh, and towns. Uh, and probably uh, the biggest definition for me is that if you try and find out where you want to go and instead of giving you a street address and uh, uh, a house number, they'll tell you to drive up until you get before the bridge a mile and then turn left <laughs> at the old barn and then you'll find somebody you're looking for. So that's about it. That is so true. That is so true. I know. Um, okay, uh, Mayor McNevin, let me keep it with you because uh, obviously all of you have heard about what COVID-19 has done to some of the much more populated areas of this province, but I want to give people a better sense about what COVID-19 has meant to much smaller places. Now, yours is an island of, I don't know what, 5,000 permanent residents or something like that. Uh, ha has COVID-19 been much of a factor at all over the past year? Oh, for sure. Uh, I mean, like like the rest of, uh, I guess, the world and communities across Ontario, uh, uh, people are, uh, are are struggling. They're fearful of uh, what this means. And uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, mental health uh, issues for people that are particularly living in vulnerable situations. So um, uh, I guess we've, we, we've had to adapt and learn. But uh, one of the biggest things that's happened is uh, on the island itself, we have uh, nine municipalities and uh, seven First Nations. Uh, and and uh, we often uh, didn't have a real sense of what the impact of uh, uh, the, each community's uh, reaction to the pandemic has been. So we've, uh, we've, we've formed a collaborative group where we meet with uh, all those parties on a weekly basis. And uh, we try and give a, an update on what's happening to each other. And uh, we, we've really learned a lot about the island, even though we've been here for many years, most of us. So it's been, uh, I think, a good thing. It's helped us to come together in a lot of ways. Okay. Mayor Isbester, what's the COVID-19 situation been like over the past year in your neck of the woods? Well, it certainly had a great effect on our small business community, which uh, we do have a combination of rural and urban, but a very vibrant downtown, sort of mom and pop sort of stores, but we also have in our outer limits, uh, the big box stores. And it's been very, very tough on our small ones to see the, um, the large ones be able to stay open. And, and it's just a constant, you know, when and how and is it safe? Uh, I think too, um, for any small community, and I'm sure that the other mayors will, will certainly agree with me, is our people don't sit and listen to any of the politicians at noon on news. They reach out, we get the phone calls. When does this end? Where can I go? Can I go for a walk? So so it's it's good for that. But a, a good thing that's come out of, out of it is the collaboration between our health services, 
the municipality and the people, the faith-based, uh, getting uh, food and so on out. So there has been a great collaboration. We just seem to be able to snap our fingers and everybody's there to help, of course, socially distance, physically distance, and they have their masks on. But but that has been a good thing. Our small businesses are suffering the most, and that has to end. Councillor Redden, how about in your part of the province? Well, similar to Mark's, we've uh, got uh, three small communities, Campbellford being the largest. So it's had a great impact on our downtown, uh, initially with the closing of all of our stores and our services. But um, we had a great volunteer effort come together to help serve those that were in their homes without family support. Um, everyone has done their best. Um, everyone's wearing masks. We're distancing. We're doing everything we should. But um, it's, it's either Either, um, there's no real in between. Either the businesses are able to service and uh, do curbside and provide uh, um, everything that, that that individuals are looking for, or they're having to close down, go home, and um, fear that they won't be op able to open again. It's uh, it's uh, a, a tough time for a small community, and um, we're doing our best. All right, Dr. Young, what is your biggest public health concern in your neck of the woods? So, Al, uh, Collingwood is not quite as rural as many of the communities that would call themselves mm -hmm. rural in Canada. And, and I would really speak to the, the, the immense uh, health care workers in rural communities are paper thin and very fragile. And so taking one of those out of a community can have a very large impact on their ability to offer care. For example, some communities might have just two x-ray techs. And so if one gets sick, then that one x-ray tech is on 24 seven for their community all the time. If you have a physician who is one of five physicians in a community that looks after all those roles and is sick, and not able to work for a couple of weeks, then then the the, the burden is super high. A obstetrics nurse who is out can close down the obstetric services of a community. So the 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 need to protect communities that are so fragile from the infection is really is really acute. And I I, I uh, so that's yeah. So I would say that the next wave of our of our priorities would be to make sure that even though there isn't high prevalence in many of these communities, uh, the the fragility of that community's healthcare sector is so high that vaccination for that those the healthcare communities but those healthcare workers is really a, a very very high priority to protect those communities and the healthcare workers within it let me ask mayor mcnevin uh, i was on the island last summer and um, went to a flea market in a town of 100 people kagawang and i was surprised when i went there that there was such adherence to the protocols even outdoors on a lovely summer afternoon Everybody had masks on. They were taking people's names and phone numbers as you walked into the flea market in case they had to follow up with contact tracing afterwards. Um, th you know, there was no monkey business. And we're talking about a place where, you know, there's maybe been a handful of cases of COVID since this whole thing began. Are you surprised at the amount of adherence to protocols you've seen? Well, I, I guess I am. It's, it seems, I guess it's been almost a year and uh, uh, people that uh, live on Manitoulin, uh, uh, I would have to say the majority have really been cautious. They've been uh, uh, really good at trying to follow the guidelines from uh, public health. And when we get contacted by a lot of our citizens, um, they have questions and we try and, and steer them that way so that they understand it. But uh, uh, it's interesting about a rural area like Manitoulin Island is uh, I'm often surprised when we're all wearing masks and we still can figure out who each other is. It's a miracle, I think. <laughs> well, as was indicated earlier, everybody knows everybody. Mark Isbester, <laughs> yeah. how about to you? Uh, your chief public health concerns at the moment are what? Um, certainly uh, the vaccine, uh, getting it, uh, which is ha it has been uh, put into our long-term care homes, uh, not so much in my part of KFLNA, which is the Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington, but I think actually they start today. A and, and just um, making sure that, that uh, we're ready for, God forbid, um, a, a, thir a third wave. Uh, we, we have to get past this. And, and, and the same as, as my other uh, components on here is, is small municipalities 
certainly, I think that they, they keep the rules. Uh, they stay by them because they're so visible to everybody. Everybody knows everybody, and everybody is ready to not so much rat people out, but to even say to them, come on, we've got to get through this together. Probably ratting out is part of it as well, but, but uh, <laughs> I, I, think, uh, I think that certainly... Uh, Certainly, there is uh, there is a respect for it, and because we support our hospital so much financially as people, not as a government, but as people, that we know the stress that we're putting on, and we know how fortunate, and I'm going to touch every piece of wood that's available to me, that we have not had this monster creep in under the doors of our long-term care. And when I look at what other municipalities are going through, my heart just goes out to them. Hmm. Catherine Redden, how much has COVID affected your community so far? Well, in terms of cases, they've been very few. Um, and we've been very fortunate as well not to have um, tremendous outbreaks in our in our nursing homes and our long term long-term uh, care homes. Um, an outbreak around here is is one individual positive. Um, so we've been very, very careful with visiting, with protocols and so on. And our hospital sits right in the center of our community. And as Mark says, uh, rural communities support um, their hospitals and their healthcare providers. We've actually had parades. We had a tractor parade earlier in the year with our agricultural community just to lift the spirits of our of our nurses and doctors and the other providers in the hospital to show them how much we care. We've lit our town with lights. Uh, our Christmas lights in many cases still still exist. Uh, signage on the, on the lawns and uh, deliveries of some of the best donuts you could find up to the individuals in the emergency to, to keep them going. It's been a long time for them and very few of us uh, don't know someone working at the hospital or in some of the other clinics. So um, we were really heartened this week to learn that some adults Doses of vaccine are now available in our area, and we just hope we can hurry that up and uh, and take care of our, our most vulnerable first. Let me follow that hasp hospital angle with Mayor Al, and that is, yeah. I think there's two hospitals on Manitoulin Island, and I'm betting that they might, I don't know, one or two ICU beds in each hospital. Uh, mm -hmm. How are they managing so far? Well, it's interesting throughout this uh, pandemic, like we've, we've found out a lot more about healthcare than we ever knew before. Uh, uh, so working together with the uh, management team at the hospital, uh, we, we, it was identified very early that they have perhaps the capability of uh, two ICU beds in uh, each hospital. And uh, it would be very quickly overrun uh, if we had an outbreak of any kind on Manitoulin. So in uh, the very beginning, after the first wave struck, we uh, we found a way to uh, work with the Manitoulin Health Centre to create a field hospital uh, with a 30-bed capacity to help in the event that uh, we had a, a, a surge or uh, an outbreak on Manitoulin Island. So uh, the, the hospital worked with the staff in uh, our, our municipality in Little Kirk, but it was a collaborative effort with other communities to create that facility in our recreation center where we have our arena and curling club. And uh, it, it was the only real building on the, the island that had separate uh, heating ventilation systems so that uh, both the patients and the uh, the workers, the healthcare providers would have a safe place to uh, either eat their meals, change into their equipment and, and go into the patient area. So uh, that's been ready since uh, early in the pandemic. Hopefully we'll never have to use it. But as Dr. Young said, there'll be, uh, there's a huge risk uh, with the number of uh, physicians and uh, uh, frontline workers at the hospital that they would be quickly overrun. And as a collaborative effort, we've been able to combine all the health care workers uh, across the island to uh, step up to that field hospital should we need it uh, in the event of another uh, surge. So. Gotcha. Um, Dr. Young, I actually want to ask you a non-medical question, although uh, I, I'm sure I'm sure medicine and healthcare come into this in a big way. Uh, broadband has been raised as a huge issue all over rural Ontario. How do you, in your work and in your contacts with, with people in your area of the province, how, how is that an issue for you? Now that so much care is being offered virtually and so much of our lives are being led virtually, it's, it to me is a basic Canadian right, access to excellent broadband um, internet, especially in rural areas where those distances are even further and 
Uh, and so for our healthcare, for example, we will we do video calls and if somebody's not able to connect with us with a good connection those are uh, it really hampered phone calls can can do the the majority of our visits but there are some interactions such as sensitive counseling or some we can do physical examinations that are you know not actually hands-on obviously but ones that that are 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 aided by that good internet connection. Mayor Marg, uh, on a typical daily basis, how's the bandwidth where you are? Well, on a typical day, I'm okay where I am, but uh, certainly we have pockets of our municipality because we are along, uh, along and, and sort of north-south. So there are pockets uh, for, for broadband, which of course we're working on, but we can't work on them nearly enough. And I'm, I'm really pleased and, and a learning process to see how it is with the health system, doctor. I had not thought about that. It's just another way to press our other governments to, to, to get their stuff together and get this broadband out. Uh, I thank you for that. I'll pass that on to my Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus. That's uh, that's good information that I probably should have thought of. Sorry to take so long. <laughs> <laughs> now, I bet when you talk to that caucus, you're not going to say, get their stuff together. I bet you're going to say something else. I was really hoping that I would get stuff <laughs> out instead of something else. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Councillor Redden, how about broadband where you are? What's it like? Well, in the urban areas, it's excellent, and uh, um, we're able to do some a lot of our meetings um, and um, a Zoom virtual community organizations are having uh, 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 meetings back and forth. But it's it's the same thing. If you're located outside of town, Northumberland is known for its hills, and if you're on the wrong mm -hmm. side of the hill, you just don't get good reception. It is becoming as important as a telephone or as electricity to have access to internet. And Mayor McNevin on the island, how's the bandwidth there? Well, it's a, it's a, a mix of uh, situations. If you're definitely, if you're outside of the settlement or village areas, it's uh, difficult. Uh, and uh, for our council itself, it's been uh, uh, quite a learning curve for uh, we, we, a lot of people live in the rural parts. Uh, we've actually been, uh, given support to some of our staff and council to uh, help them uh, join those meetings or work from home, including helping with the tower, small tower installation so that they can get uh, connected to different uh, internet providers. Uh, but uh, like all uh, rural municipalities, it's a major uh, struggle. And uh, we're, we've been supporting applications by a number of uh, providers to try and get funding through different uh, provincial and federal programs. And we're hoping that as time goes on, we'll see those start to materialize. Uh, uh, like we've heard from a lot of other communities, the, it's essential today. Uh, we, we can't operate anymore with people not being connected. And it's uh, been very difficult for the uh, children that are at home, uh, often uh, having to work online with uh, two or three uh, children in the family with no bandwidth, uh, maybe even not enough computers. It's uh, tricky sometimes. Okay, let's spend some time here on something that we hear a lot about in the big cities, but having you four here, you're like a mini focus group where we can actually test whether this is actually happening. Dr. Young, to you first. We are hearing that because of the intensity of COVID-19 in big cities, and of course the price of housing as well, a lot of people have just decided, you know what, enough of the city. I am moving to a less populated part of Ontario, better quality of life, cheaper, uh, far farther away from COVID, are you seeing any signs on the ground that this is actually happening in your neck of the woods? I can't tell you how many signs on the ground I'm seeing of that happening. <laughs> um, first off, many people have winter homes and they have come since the beginning of the pandemic, pandemic have come to work from those second homes. And, uh, and the uh, number of 416 telephone numbers that we have in our emergency room and in our businesses is, is really increased over the last uh, during the pandemic um the housing market has absolutely exploded and housing costs are uh, you, can't, you can't find a house and when you do find one you're i have a friend who's a real estate agent and a realtor and she has had uh, a 22-way uh, bid on one house most recently so the the, the it's it's hugely hugely uh changed this last year i guess people who are in 
are happy that their home prices and values are going up. But I guess if you're trying to get a place, tougher now? Well, it's hard for people who want to buy their first home to, to now compete with that Toronto market. I would say there's it's, it's tough now. If you want to own a house in Collingwood, you need a, almost need a two-income two household. Hmm. Okay, Catherine Redden, how about in Trent Hills? How is it there? Well, right now, I'm really pleased to say that our construction um, industry is it's booming, booming. We've got at least uh, two, possibly three housing developments underway, um, geared more to uh, a retirement um, age, but we've got some condos, um, single family homes. Um, and in the last year, probably 12 to 15 homes already up and built in Campbellford. And in the outlying areas, we're seeing individuals moving in from the city, deciding to drive in and out of the out of uh, Toronto or Ajax and have their family um, enjoy a, a, a slower pace of life. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of cottage conversions or additions put onto them Rather than three season, they're going to four season, and they're choosing to work from here. And um, that just um, harkens to um, our issues around around the internet and access for them to stay. And tremendous number of home based businesses where they're building garages and additions they can work from. So it's it's booming. And Mayor Marg and Napanee. Oh, it, the same thing, of course. We're right on 401 and uh, uh, certainly between uh, two large centres that are military centres within uh, Trenton, uh, CFB Trenton and CFB Kingston. So so you are bringing a lot of people into the area that, that do want to stay here for a lot of reasons, just as, as Catherine has said, which has put a lot of pressure on supplies, put a lot of pressure on our trades, uh, good pressure, uh, and a lot of pressure on our development services uh, for our uh, our municipality, trying to make sure mm -hmm. that we get things done. I, I would think that the same maybe as Trent Hills, we are seeing more of a, a of a senior population that's coming here, and the amenities that they want are things that we're going to have to start being able to uh, to supply. You know, things are going to have to change. They want to come here because of the safety but they will be a demanding population for the amenities that they're going to require as well. Hmm. Now, Mayor Al, I wouldn't think, given that you're anywhere from a six to an eight hour drive from the 416, I wouldn't think you were much of an option for people who wanted to get away from the city, are you? <laughs> well, it's surprising. I, I think I'll share what we've already heard from our other uh, participants, but the, uh, um, I'll give you an example. Like there's a uh, one chap that I met that uh, moved to the island uh, that was capable of working from home and renovated uh, his uh, cottage into a, a year-round residence. And he worked for a company that had an office in uh, Liberty Village in Toronto with 400 employees. And since the uh, pandemic has started, everyone's been uh, working from home and the, they're in a business that they can have, work in a digital environment. So. Um, uh, it turns out that not only are they moving from Toronto to Manitoulin Island and to Collingwood and other places, but uh, now that they can uh, prove that they can reliably do their jobs, some of them are moving back to where they grew up, whether it's in the East Coast or the West Coast, and then they have their <laughs> weekly meetings or daily meetings. Uh, they're all over the country now, and I, I think that the last uh, year has been a record year for us uh, on Manitoulin in terms of building permits and construction and renovation. You can't buy a stick of lumber on the weekend anymore here without uh, lining up for it. You know, it's very busy and uh, it will put pressure on uh, the services we provide. They will demand uh, better services than we currently have. And, and in terms of healthcare, it's uh, obviously a big factor because uh, we're, we're, you know, we ramp up in the summers for visiting population when we have locum doctors, et cetera. But uh, to start providing it year round, we're going to have to look at solutions that uh, give us better. Councillor hmm. Councillor sure. Redden, how about the notion of Ontarians who couldn't cross the border and go to the United States as they might have done at some point in the past year? Have you noticed more in-province tourism in your part of the province? 
Oh, absolutely. I think there's a new term coming out called um, over tourism. And um, as much as we had it on our wish list to um, have everybody know where Trent Hills was and all the amenities within it, we had so many individuals come this year that we literally couldn't handle them and had to uh, had to shut down a number of our parks actually and restrict access to others. Um, it was very difficult. We we love having people come and see what we have here. But on the other hand, there's a lot of work that we have to do to upgrade the amenities, uh, washrooms, um, facilities for food, um, and just having individuals that go in and look after the parks um, after hours. Um, however, um, the good thing is now they, uh, the cottages were um, fully booked, the campgrounds were booked, and we have people that um, did a lot of staycations here. And so our um, our locations were were um, busy, and um, in some cases overwhelmed. So uh, that's on our chart for for this year and the next few years is to be able to handle all of that, and to, to keep them coming. Hmm. I want to thank the four of you for spending so much time with us on TVO tonight and giving us a sense of what's going on in your part of the province. Al McNevin from Manitoulin Island, Marg Isbester from Greater Napanee, Catherine Redden from Trent Hills, Dr. Jennifer Young in Collingwood. Be safe, everybody, and thanks so much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And that is the agenda for this Family Day, Monday, February 15th, 2021. Journalist Melissa Fung's new documentary examines the lives of girls abducted in Nigeria by Boko Haram. Tomorrow, ahead of its world broadcast premiere on TVO, we'll learn just how complex the story of that film is. Also, we'll find out about an Ontario town originally settled by black pioneers, but whose presence there was all but erased. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.